morning, good evening to everyone. Grab your Bibles. We're going into the Word of God. We do not want to miss a minute. It is not just me. I know it's not just me. I know you have seen it, felt it, been involved with it, or maybe going through it yourself. All of us are wrestling in the area of our mental, emotional, uh, you know, we deal with physical stuff, but just having the strength to deal with the stuff we're going through. Anybody felt that? Uh, this, this lesson tonight came about from some classes that I was teaching, counseling, into the weekend, spilled over. You know, even though I had to preach, there was some needs when I got done. I had to get on the phone and, you know, and talk to some folk. And it seemed to me that I, what I want to talk about tonight is how come it looks like you got power and you're doing so well sometimes and then other times or well, the next moment it looks like we're out of power we're having a power failure or a power shortage what happened that shook us or what happened that we could not maintain some flow of equilibrium with all the scriptures we know all the praising all the church how come I hit those lows and then highs? And, then, and I, I talked to God about it. And I'm going to show you some things that God taught me as we go into this lesson tonight. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, please bring back to my remembrance everything that you want spoken tonight. For truly, you are the teacher and the preacher. And we just ask, Lord, that you know the needs of your people, that you would show up here right now. Somebody has been seeking you. Somebody needs help. Somebody has almost let go. But tonight, God, I ask that you give them an understanding of your power, your never-ending power, your unending care and love for us, and let them know, God, that you already are working on their behalf. You never stopped, and they're going to make it through. Lord, bring back to my mind again that which you once said in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Um, we are into this ending of our Lenten season, this Easter season, this resurrection season. We're rapidly heading toward Holy Week, Palm Sundays, this Sunday, and from there, you know, it's been such a special uh, and empowering time every time we remember uh, the cross and the victory that Christ won for us there. But it's also a hectic time. And right now we're also living in this world where prophetically we see, yes we do, everything. We see things not getting better but getting worse. Have you ever really looked at how upside down sometimes our world is right now? It is the strangest thing. But I thank God that he made the church so that we are, through his word, his word meets every problem. He made it through his word that we can adjust. He made us as believers when we can adjust and live through and become victorious over anything that we're facing. I hope you believe that tonight. So go to me to Luke 24, a very quizzical part of this whole Easter drama or resurrection drama of Jesus Christ. Uh, the first part of this text is about those on the road to Emmaus. And where I'm picking up at is they've already talked to Jesus. They didn't know he was Jesus. And then they went back to Jerusalem and said, surely he has risen. And they found the other 11 disciples. You know, it was only 11 now because Judas was gone. And then Jesus popped up and showed again and he began to speak to them. And this verse 44 down to verse 53 is the latter part of his discussion with his disciples uh, from the Luke's perspective of this last chapter so that we can see what Jesus was saying to them. So verse 44, Luke 24. And he said unto them, These words, these are the words which I speak unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled. That's very important. Which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets, 
and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in the name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you. But tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued or endowed with power from on high. Verse 45 and verse 49, excuse me. And behold, I send the promise of the Father upon you. But tarry you in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endowed with with power from on high. We're going to speak from this theme tonight, or for the next two weeks. We'll see how this study goes. Where does the power come from to keep going? If you're an honest believer, you'll know just like I know that life is tough. Life can be tough and then sometimes tougher. Can I get a witness? And just trying to stay mentally, emotionally, and physically healthy is a challenge. I mean, most of our lives, your life and my life, is filled with pressures. And sometimes we can't even fake it. You know, we can't even fake it by doing all the Christian churchy stuff. That that doesn't get it because there's going to be moments when you have to be alone. Am I hitting somebody? And you need to know that power is real. How do I tap into the power? And I said it earlier that the pressures that come into our lives, I'm not the only one, pressures on our relationships, with our spouses, with our children, pressures from our homes, maybe the environment, the atmosphere, what you're living in right now is not that good. Pressures from uh, looking at our job and our work, pressures from looking at the economy. And we definitely don't want to look politically at what's going on in our world and how they have weaponized politics. So there's just so many things happening that can just put pressure. And, and I was thinking, as I was going back in my, uh, on YouTube, I looked at some good old church services. You know, you never know that the time you're living in might be the good old days. Now, I think every day is a good day that God gives us above the earth. But I'm talking about when the world was at a place or the church was at a place that, they're at, that we're not at now. You know, we've always been in a battle. But now we're in this battle that just seems like it's a, a lost tunnel of people out there that just do, do not respect or receive the word of God. So the church has its work cut out. So I want to talk to everybody individually, and I want to talk to you about what to do uh, uh, to keep the power. Where does your power come from uh, so you can keep going? And don't sit there and act like you never had a moment when you didn't feel like stopping. And one of the reasons we need power is because every morning when you get up, you know this, right? We face three enemies consistently. And wherever your walk is, it will tell how um, victorious or how well you're doing it handling your journey with these enemies. Let me get to it. Somebody here, just let me know. You have seen pressure. I know God said this is a timely message. Somebody out there is trying to figure out how do I survive because the pressure keeps mounting. So here's Here's the one thing I want you to know. As soon as you get up, there's three enemies. Understand the battle. The first enemy we have is the world. 1 John 2.16. This world system. This world system that's bent way over to the enemy. You have to fight to get a word in for God now. Not only on primetime television, but you got to fight to get a word in God. Sometimes our churches even find themselves at trying to adjust to be more like the world instead of understanding that we can use different methods but the power, the bottom line is the power still comes from the word. The power still comes from God. So 1 John 2 16 says for all that is in the world is the lust of the eyes lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and the pride of the life. Now like the last part of that text it says this is not of the father but of the world. And that's what the world is about. 
lusting after things. People in church, we're thinking we're deprived because we don't understand some of the things we're lusting after really have nothing to do with our divine destiny, have nothing to do with how well you're going to make it, and have nothing to do with the reality of your desires. So you need to check yourself. Check, check and see. Am I just lusting that or is that something that's going to help me walk with God? That's your first enemy. Don't let the world overtake you. You're going to find more pressure. Second one is your flesh. Romans 8, 6 and 7 says, I'm going to read this from an NLA. The mind governed by the flesh is death. It says in the King James to be carnally minded. But the, the NIV version says, the mind that is governed by the flesh, your mind. When you wake up in the morning, your mind starts directing you where to go, what to do, what to think how you feel, how your life is doing, and if you let that mind turn you down the dark road because the flesh is never satisfied, you're going to find yourself a, a believer with no power because your mind now has been obsessed in a fleshly direction and, and your mind will start wanting and doing things or your flesh will. Look what it says in the 6th and 7th verse of Romans. Let me finish reading it. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. That's what I'm saying. God can give you peace. I got to witness in the middle of the worst battle if your mind is stayed on him. If your mind understands that I can't let my flesh govern how I think and what I do. The mind governed by the flesh, verse 7, is hostile to God. It does not submit to the law of God, nor can it. God is saying, that's Romans 8, 6 and 7, it's saying right now, you want to start feeling some peace, some relief? Put your mind back on the law of God, the word of God. Get your mind back. Don't let the world, the world will take you somewhere where you'll be jumping off a cliff. If you don't understand that God has blessed you, that you are a winner, that everything's going to work out. But if your mind starts allowing a fleshly disposition to control you, it does not make a difference how much word you receive. The devil, Ephesians 6, 11, and 12. So you got the world, the flesh, and the devil. You know these enemies, but I'm trying to show you how they're relevant in your battle. Ephesians says, put on the whole armor of God. Yeah, and I like that. He just said, put on a piece of it. That's something to think about. Well, we, we might have an area of armor that's stronger than another area, but the very area that we don't put on, or the piece we don't put on, could be the foundation of our problem today. But anyway, it said, put on the whole armor of God that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The devil is constantly scheming. Listen, don't, act, don't think it's you. The enemy will get your mind so jacked up that you'll start thinking, oh, why am I doing this? Sometimes you've got to know, know the difference between which enemy is attacking you. Is it something I heard in the world to drive me crazy and I, I desire it or I let it take me to a place that I shouldn't be? Is it my flesh, my flesh wanting stuff so that I cannot be in the will of God, or is it the enemy? you got to know this, because the source of our pressure, our, uh, the bottom line is these three enemies are consistent. There are some other things, because the flesh is, is actually talking about, you know, what I allow my flesh to do in my body, and, and how I walk in the world, and how I let the enemy, because you need to know the devil can do nothing to you that you don't allow. What I mean by that, because that statement can be deceptive, he will try to do everything to you, but he can only be successful in the areas that you allow. So that's why this lesson is called, where does the power come from? We need power to survive these everyday battles. Um, I can tell you there's been times during my pastorate, times in my life, forget my pastorate, where I have been on through a mental health, through mental health issues at a long stretch. I mean, where I was just drifting from one problem in my mind. You looked at me and thought, thought everything was okay, but I was battling every day because what happens with these pressures, the real battle, battleground is our mind, right? Casting down imaginations. Our mind is what you have to hold on to. Some things don't even have to be real. Uh-huh, and they're controlling your life right now, and it's not even real. It's just a thought that you thought about that you need to cast down and put some word in that place so you can think, well, bring yourself back to a place where you can think what God said.
But a lot of believers do not want to fess up to this. But I've been pressed. I've been moments when I had to preach. I've been fighting off anxiety. Um, all of us have to deal with compulsive or obsessive compulsive thoughts or behaviors. And I tell people when you're going through these times, the truth of the matter is everybody's going through it. I just finished a, se a series on anxiety. You can go back and look at it how to deal with anxieties and fears and struggles, because those are, are real battlegrounds. But I'm going a little further here. I believe that you need to understand that if the mental pressure is such that it's leading you to a place of hopelessness, you might need to, no, you do need to seek some professional help. Maybe you need a therapist. Maybe you need some medication. And, but I, and, I, and I want to tell you that because I believe medication and therapists definitely will help relieve our problems and it can lead us on the road to health. But the bottom line is you still can't get total relief or have long-term healing of mental problems, anxiousness, depression, compulsive, compulsive, obsessive behavior, whatever you want to call it. You can't get long-term relief without God. Why? Because we were created for God. There's a place in our soul, in our minds, where only God can calm that. God is the only one that can give eternal peace. God is the only one that can fight the battle when I can't fight it. God is the only one that knows what I'm really going through. God is the only one that can help me when nobody else can help me. Because God already is trying to make a way for me to deal with it. I just have to tune back into what God is saying. So when you do get therapy or medication, don't make that your end all, but you need to do that because God wants us to have enough wisdom to know that we need to talk to somebody. I have several people in my life I use constantly, good brothers, good friends of mine, you know, they're all professionals and we talk to each other when we have problems we cannot handle. I got, I got somebody I can, who can help me, you know, go through this and deal with this. We get so messed up because we want to tell our stuff to the wrong people. Make sure it's somebody who can help you. Amen? But listen, how do I know only God can help? Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving that your request be made known unto God. Here it is. And the peace of God. Okay, so I got relief from my therapist. My medication just kicked in. I took care of all those chemical releases. But now I got something to hold on to because I got the word of God. Did you see that three-pronged attack to my mental issues that I made sure that at the foundation, the bottom of it all is I still got that word I can hold on to because God is saying, even with all that going on, be anxious for nothing. First Peter 5 and 7, listen to it. Casting all your cares. That word there, translated cares, is the word anxiety. There it is again. All of us go through anxiety. Don't let anyone tell you they're so holy or they're so powerful, but they're walking in so much victory that they don't have to deal with constant pressure and anxieties. And it says the reason we cast it on God, 1 Peter 5 and 7, because he cares for us. And if you slide down to that eighth verse, which I didn't get in my notes here, but you know what it says, be because your adversary, the devil, is going around seeking whom he may devour. Just bringing you back to the fact that you have an enemy. Don't forget that. You're in a battle. And then John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. So wait a minute, God. When you left, you left me peace. So if I don't have peace, it means I have not accessed your peace. That's right. God is saying that if you don't, if you're not aware of these things, you're going to find yourself in a position where your power has run out where you don't know where to get help. Let me tell you this crazy story. I was locked in my car last week. That's right, inside the car. Let me tell you how that happened. I'm sitting in the car, I have a, a push start, you know, you press the button, and so the key also is one of those keys you press, unlock doors, open up doors. So I'm sitting in the car, and I had noticed for about a week or more, I would have to push it twice just to unlock the doors and get in, but it was still working, so I was fine. And I got in the car, and when I pulled up, my door wouldn't open. So, of course, I pressed the key, because, you know, you're supposed to unlock all the doors. Sound like I heard two doors unlock, but my driver's side wouldn't unlock. And I'm sitting there, the window wasn't down, I'm sitting there because I'm, I'm pressing. 
Then all of a sudden, I said, I'm going to have to get out of here. So I rolled, I put the key back in. No, I, I pressed on the key until I heard a lock go. And I got the window, enough power so the window would go down. And it went down partway. I got my hand outside. I took the inside key. You know the key that's inside your key? I took that key out. My head's in the window. And I'm sticking it through there. And I got the door unlocked. And I said, Phew. So, of course, I called the dealer. Uh, went straight, find out what was going on. And he said, it sounds like your battery and your key. I said, yeah, but well, some of the doors were unlocked. And he said, well, you, what you got to understand is you've been driving. And so at this point to get out the car, you needed more power. You had a little that would roll down the window, but you needed a full battery. You, you were at a place where you were stuck because you did not have enough power. He was correct. He changed the key in my, the battery in my key. Now everything works. What am I trying to tell you? Many of you are stuck in a place where you don't have enough power and you're, and you're at the point where you don't know where the power comes from. I didn't know what was going on. I surmised that it wasn't the battery because some of the doors were unlocked. Well, yeah, it was. And the problem is we got to figure out what happens when we get stuck and we don't have any power. There's a whole lot of believers that's listening to me right now. You're strong one minute, you're up and down. We're going through this, these trials. But I want to share with you how God has kept me and taught me some things so that when I get to this place, how I have maintained some victory, how I have maintained some stability. Uh, you know how some people tell you, I got it all going on? No, no. I'm telling you that I know how to tap into God's power. If you're listening to me, I want you to learn that tonight because God shared with me what was going on. God helped me in the times when I was hopeless. He helped me in the times when it looked like emotionally I was lost, I was drained, and I want to teach you what God taught me to deal with during those times. And here's what God said to me when I asked him about this situation. How did I get to the place that I'm this week right now? I just preached yesterday. I just prayed this morning. Here's what God said in my time of seeking. He said, you don't know me. I let us seek and I said, what? God, I do know you. God said, yeah, but you don't know me well enough. I said, what do you mean? He says that you don't know me in all my fullness. And I made some adjustments because God was right. I'm going to say it again because I want you to follow me. God said to me, I don't know him well enough. I don't know him in his fullness. That I know stuff, but I didn't know him well enough. Now, he wasn't talking about, you know, getting down and straining and getting to know uh, more word. That's part of it. Or, you know, pray more. That's part of it. He said, no, but you have to understand where the power comes from. You're not utilizing your relationship with me to the fullest. Here is what God said to me. He said, the question is, you don't know me, God, the Holy Spirit. Gotcha. When we think about God most times, we're thinking about God the Father. And to differentiate between that, we'll say, or well, Jesus is God. You know, we're teaching some theological stuff. Jesus is God. So we are, we are, we are a, a point or make sure we make sure Jesus has his title as God. But we don't minister to, recognize, or purposely, intentionally walk with God, the Holy Spirit. Not God, that spirit that makes you shout and holler or you get a feeling. Not that God. Not God that makes you run around the church. Not just the God that makes you speak in tongues if you're a tongue talker. I'm not talking about that God. I'm talking about the God who lives inside of you, whose only job is to make sure you have victory. That's where the power comes from. Listen, God is one, so the power comes, of course, from knowing God the Father, God the Son, but also there is a special assignment that God the Holy Spirit has, which means that God the Holy Spirit is the one who lives in us, and we're going to look at the attributes of God the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that when you intentionally start calling God the Holy Spirit, when you intentionally get past the shivers and, and thinking 
thinking about, you know, what we were taught wrong growing up about the Holy Spirit, when you get past the, all of the uh, mannerisms and all of the, you know, acting out and all the animation about the Spirit and just start ministering to God, the Holy Spirit, something different happens in your life. God said, you don't know me. Now, what's interesting is Jesus has just been crucified, buried, and resurrected. I'm in our text. Luke's Gospel 24. You know, there's many resurrection texts that we preach on Easter. But in Luke's Gospel, and Dr. Luke, who is the author of Luke's Gospel and Acts, ties in something that is significant tonight that you need to see. And this is what God told me. He said, everything that happened in the Old Testament, everything that happened in your life since you've been saved, everything that you experienced, everything you read about, all culminated to one powerful event. And he talks about that in this 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Look what he says in Luke 24, verse 49. Now, I already set it up for you. They're on the road to Emmaus, right? Jesus comes in. They don't know who he is. They share a meal with him. And then he finally says to them, oh, fools and slow of heart to learn. Because uh, they wondered why he didn't know what had happened. He did know what had happened. But they were so depressed or so short of power that he said, don't you, don't you know all the stuff you believers that you learned was so that you could understand my death had to be because if I didn't die, the power couldn't come. And now that the power has come, watch this, look at this. He said, I want to tie this together because I believe somebody's sitting there right now and God the Holy Spirit is looking at you saying, I sure wish you talked to me. I sure wish you turned to me. And yes, you got to call him by his name. You call God the Father by his name. You say in the name of Jesus, you got to now also minister to or recognize that it's God the Holy Spirit that can bring truth. God the Holy Spirit that can lead me. God the Holy Spirit that can intercede for me. God the Holy Spirit that empowers me. God the Holy Spirit who lives in me. And once you learn that, you start finding power in places you never had power. Listen to this thought. Ever since you've been saved, from the moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit came to live in you and has never left. He didn't leave you on a bad day. He didn't leave you in your good times. He didn't leave because you tried to leave. Once he came and lived in you, he stayed. And when he stayed, he's there for one purpose, to give you victory. Wait till we go into the scriptures and I show you. And what we're going to do, so you understand how I'm mapping this out, we're going to look at this text and what uh, the Holy Spirit, how Jesus, the resurrected Christ, was trying to tell them, make sure you don't miss the promise. Watch, listen. The promise. The big promise. The promise that brings the battle. The promise for what he died for. The promise of what the whole plan of redemption was about. The promise of what the resurrection was about. It is knowing that you've been empowered to another state, to another position in God by the Holy Spirit. You are somebody. You, the Bible says we can cast down imaginations and we can lay hands on the sick. The Bible tells us there's power, but you got to know how to tap into the power by recognizing. Come on, look at verse 49. And behold, this is after Jesus told him, I must, I had to die and be raised again. I've shared this with you so many times. Why don't you believe me? And then he said, and behold, after getting through all that, I send the promise of my father upon you. But go wait in Jerusalem until you are endowed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands, verse 50, and it, verse 51, and it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted and carried into the heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem in great joy. Now shift to Acts 1 and 8. See, we use Acts 1 and 8 as a scripture of power, but sometimes we don't recognize where the power is coming from. We don't treat it as the power that God has sent, and that's God the Holy Spirit, the power that we're dealing with. Look at Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, 
and you shall be my witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem in all Judea in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth this is the empowering the culmination of the promise the power or how God the Father, God the Holy Spirit and God the Son was going to make sure that no believer would be a failure and no believer would not have enough power to handle the darkest situation. A thousand demons can come and I can handle them because we forgot that all he did was to get us to the place that we recognize I've got the Holy Spirit living in me. I'm not weak. I'm going to have to sit up here and take this. My mind can be bought under, you know, under my command. I, I can think the thoughts I want to think. I'm not just running around here and being tossed all over the place. I have God, the Holy Spirit, in me constantly trying to help me get to a place of victory. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Come on, somebody's excited about this, as I was when God showed this to me. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? God said, I made this a temple. Your body is my house. Your body is where I choose to live. Oh my God. And God the Holy Spirit is so powerful that he lives in every one of us and it's the equivalent of me being able to speak words and power comes forward. Think thoughts and power comes forward as long as I recognize the power emanates from God the Holy Spirit. Somebody ought to say, I got the Holy Spirit living in me. Every now and then just shake yourself. God lives down inside of me. Why am I sitting here crying? Why am I looking sad? God is here with me right now. He promised to never leave me and he indwells in me. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, that you are not your own. Don't miss that. He's saying, when you sit up there and try to grind this thing out on your own, think you have to be you know, one of these saints that show off and show all your abilities and all your gifts in front of other people, you're going to find yourself exhausted. But when you remember you're not your own, your actions change, your thoughts change, your battle position changes, you're no longer on the bottom trying to fight your way up. You come at this thing knowing that I have God, the Holy Spirit, inside of me. And then 2 Corinthians 6.16. 6, okay, write these scriptures down. I want you to follow me. Or what agreement had the temple of God with idols? For we are a temple of the living God. Just as God said. This is the promise God said. Old Testament promise. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Brothers, sisters, those listening, all you have to do is what Paul told Timothy. Stir up that gift, that Holy Spirit that's living inside of you. And right now, I declare you can get victory. Right now, I don't care what it is you're going through, when you realize, when you get to that place that you're in a power shortage, turn your mind on God, the Holy Spirit, and watch Him go to Work. When, I, when I show you all these scriptures, all the Bible says about what the Holy Spirit is doing, we're going to be amazed at why we even allow ourselves to be down when we know what God is doing in our life. So let's talk about this because this is talking about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about that doctrine. So when God said to me, you don't know me that well, Here's what he was saying. You got to know who God is. Here's who God is, according to the scriptures. God is a personal, all-powerful, all-knowing, eternal, loving spirit that is composed of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit, watch this, theological doctrine, means that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. Uh, uh, they, they, they express, when you think about God, God is so powerful that 
even though there's three expressions, you know, God the Father as um, our creator, right? Um, God the Father as our Abba Father, right? He's the one we look at who will throw his arms around us. Jesus the Son as our Redeemer. Uh, Jesus the Son um, um, as our Savior. They see, there's the, they're one God with multiple purposes. And we know those purposes of God the Father and God the Son, but sometimes we don't embrace the purposes of God the Holy Spirit. He's our advocate. He's our intercessor. There's so many names that we can deal with. Let me give you some scriptures because some people say uh, there is no such thing as a trinity. Well, I beg to differ. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. Let's say it again. No, the word trinity itself is not in the Bible, but the example of Trinity is in the scriptures. Look what he said. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's our Lord, and the love of God, there's God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Colossians 2, 9, clearly identify that there is a trinity, and God speaks of it for himself. Colossians 2, 9 says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily is in Jesus. Let's look at that again. All the fullness, meaning that um, I, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus said, I'm going to pray the Father. He's going to send you a comforter. And all of us dwell together in you. Jesus in bodily form was the Godhead bodily. Every time you see God the Father, you're really talking to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. But you have to also address what their specific assignments or what their specific way they interact with us in our relationship. That makes sense? How God the Father, I cry and call on him because I see him as the one that sent his son to die on my behalf. As the one ruling uh, from the beginning. Although the word Elohim is really a word that is of um, multiple characters. It doesn't mean one person. It means more than one. So when God said in the beginning God, he's talking about all of us. God the Holy Spirit was there. God the Father was there. God the Son was there. And we know the power of God. We, I know I'm going to have to pick this up next week, and, and, but I want you to get this. So what I want to do is look at some of the power that we understand from God the Father based on his names and his works. Some of the power we call on Jesus for based on who he is, his names and his works. And then we're going to spend most of our time lifting up, looking at. The beauty, the majesty of the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling, blessing, and keeping us. So let's look, at, let's look at one of the attributes that show us that we, we know this already. We pray about this. This is something that lets us know about God. One of the names of God the Father is Jehovah Jireh. In Genesis twenty-two fourteen, 14, right? It says, Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now, a good theologian will tell you that since God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one, um, we don't, even though this says that Jehovah Jireh is God's name and he's the provider, it is also Jesus and the Son who are there with God the Father, who are supply, who are providing and supplying our needs. But don't get tricked. What I need you to do is we're going to put special emphasis on understanding the work of the Holy Spirit in God, how God the Holy Spirit works through the Godhead. So we know one of the ways is God is a provider. Everybody lift your hand if you know God is a provider. How many times have you prayed, Lord, you are my Jehovah Jireh? We sing about it. You are my provider. I know that you are the one who can bless me. And I know that you are the one who keeps me. And we know that when we call on God, 
we know that who that's who he is. Or we can say, Lord uh, Jehovah Rapha, and we call upon him. This is the Lord, our healer. Exodus 15 is an interesting chapter because it talks about, um, and verse 26 says this, saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, Exodus 15, 26, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. For I am Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your healer. I am the God that healeth thee. So, we understand that. We call on God to be our healer. And what he was telling his people, which we know they did not do, if you can just be faithful and don't act like all of the heathens and all the folk, I'm, I'm trying to take you into the land to possess. If you don't act like them and start bowing down to their gods and start doing idolatry and, you know, not, not bless me or believe in me, he said, if you listen to my voice, I'll make sure none of the diseases that were put on the Egyptians would come on you. That's a powerful promise from God because we know that God is our Jehovah Rapha. So we know this. We know God. We know God. We know that about God. If God said, you don't know me, I said, God, I know you as my healer. I could give you the scripture. I know you, God, um, as my provider. I can tell you where that was. We also know God is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. You know where this came from. In, Gideon, in Judges chapter 6, when Gideon was the judge, um, he built an altar there to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. And to this day, it stands in Oprah, which belongs to the Abizarites. What it's saying is, God gave this fearful Gideon victory enough that he gave him peace to carry out his plan for him. You know, when God first showed up to get him, he told him, you're a mighty man of power. He said, who me? But God gave Gideon enough peace that he was able to knock down Baal's, you know, to, to go out there and knock down the idol and to have enough strength to ask God even to show up and show himself. And he had enough strength to be, you know, even if he was in the wine cellar, he had enough strength to, to be in there making sure that he was um, pressing the wheat. What am I saying is that God is known as Jehovah Shalom. And everybody knew this Lord's Prayer. Jehovah Ra. Psalms 23 and 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Then I could go on down to Jehovah to sit canoe. You know all of those names. So we know God. We're, we're intimate with names that show the power of what God does. And we know Jesus. We know some things about Christ because we know, first of all, he is the head of the church, right? We are his body. He's the head of the church. Write this down. Ephesians 1, 22 uh, tells us he's the head of, of the church. Uh, Ephesians 4, 15 tells us he's the head of the church. If someone is say um, Jesus is our, is our head, and we know the church is the bride, and he's the bridegroom. We know that. You know, we know intimately uh, Colossians. I love this powerful one. He's the firstborn of all creation. Uh, Colossians 1.15. Jesus is not the first thing created. No, he is the creator. There we go again. How is he the creator? Because as God is the creator... Jesus was also there. They're one. We're talking about the Godhead. And we're talking about all the power that comes out, comes together. But there's a certain specific point when you will, you will start praying to Jesus as being the firstborn of all creatures. So I'm trying to make sure I get into the image of Jesus. And all you've done is recognize again the power of the Son. We know that he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 19. 16, right? He has dominion over all the earth. And in the last battle, we know that it's going to be Jesus that brings us and gives us our victory. 
Um, we, we know when we get caught up in the rapture, we're going to meet Jesus in the air. That's Jesus, God, the Son. We know that he's God. We know what he's going to do. He's the light of the world. He's the Prince of Peace. We, we know all of these things about Jesus, but what do we know about the Holy Spirit? We're going to talk about in the next few weeks, you don't want to miss it, what you need to do when you need power to keep going. Power to keep going has been provided to us by understanding the work of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit, God, which lives in me, man, that makes me powerful right now, is continuing to bless me so I can survive, so you can survive. So you know what I want you to do? I want you to start looking at, if I can give you some homework before we come back together, look at those scriptures on the power of the Holy Spirit and watch how God blesses you. That's it tonight. It's Pastor Duncan's saying, let somebody know about this teaching. And I will see you for part two as we look at where does the power come from. Make sure you don't have a power shortage. God bless you. Have a good night.